Hello and welcome to Nirmal Bang, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Hiral Dhatia. We have with us Abhishek uh, Rastaugi, partner at Kathan and Company and Advocate Supreme Courts and various high courts joining in. Welcome to the show, Abhishek, and always a pleasure to speak to you. And this is the most crucial time where it's the best for all the viewers to get insights from you as well. Thank so, you. Thank you for, the, for welcoming me. And it's always a pleasure for me as well uh, to be at your show. Thank you so much. Abhishek, my first question coming to you is that the last couple of years, you know, usually it's been that people have not really taken a bu the budget as a major event due to the, you know, I mean, we know a lot of things that have changed. However, taking budget 2022 into consideration from a taxation perspective, do you think it is going to be a crucial event or is it going to be a non-event firstly? Uh, I think it's going to be crucial from the perspective of getting some more incentives, for sure. Uh, we have seen the new way of working in this COVID environment. And, you know, a lot of that has to do uh, with working from home. So a lot of salaried class people, a lot of other people have started spending more money with respect uh, to when it comes to work from home. So there could be high internet costs, there could be extra mobile phones, etc., battery usage, more devices and so on and so forth. So I think the interesting aspect which may come to make this a little more populist budget could be some sort of an incentive, uh, the way you have standard deduction, some sort of that deduction which may come to give some uh, breather or some relief uh, to the taxpayers. That is on the card. So that may certainly make it more interesting. Right. So overall, you know, if you have to put down buckets where you have to say that, okay, these are the two buckets that we should be looking at in terms of ex expectations from the budget. One bucket, the most likely one, and two, there is an expectation, but most unlikely to come through. How would you divide those? So that's a fantastic question, uh, I'm sure. But I think before going to that question, it's important to understand that certainly the finance minister is looking to improve the tax buoyancy. There is no doubt about that. And at the same time, we cannot ignore the number of fiscal deficit which we have today. So if we see the government spendings, in some quarters, the spending is significantly less this year. But if we see the revenue, and I have some data, uh, uh, starting uh, numbers, the revenue has gone up significantly. So what it means is that as far as the fiscal deficit is concerned, it may not be to the extent of 6.8% for the financial year, which was expected or which was calculated at the beginning of the year. So the fiscal deficit may not be 6.6%. Now, how will the fiscal deficit be fixed for the subsequent year will completely depend on the tax revenue collections which happen because so what I intend to say is that the finance minister, I think she will do a very pragmatic job to ensure that there is improve of tax buoyancy, but at the same time, she doesn't cross the threshold of the fiscal deficit. This year, it may, she may not cross the fiscal deficit at all, because if we see some of the tax collections, the advanced tax collections uh, after quarter three rose by about 53.5%. Yeah. If you see the direct tax collections, they have it has gone up uh, as much as 60%. And if you see the GST collections at all also, for each of the month, that GST collection has been more than one trillion. So, which means, you know, uh, with some uh, great numbers in at least two, three months. So, the revenue has gone up. The tax collections have improved. Now, as far as tax buoyancy issue is concerned, she will address that. Now, will it be a populist budget, keeping in mind various elections, state elections, and so on and so forth? I think what will happen and what will not happen. To answer your question from that perspective, I feel today, what will not happen? Let's go to that. What will not happen? If we see the high income category group uh, of individuals, there's a surcharge of 10% for 50 lakhs to 1 crore. There is a 15% surcharge for income between 1 crore and 2 crore. For income between 2 crore and 5 crore, there is a 25% surcharge. And 37% surcharge when it comes to income of more than five crores. I think this 
these tax brackets are facing lot of income tax burden there is less of motiv motivation for a person who's you know earning more than 5 crore rupees to pay 37% of surcharge which is phenomenally phenomenally high so uh, are we looking for some rejig on the surcharge yeah. looks difficult because as i mentioned that the intention will still remain to improve tax buoyancy so mm -hmm. that may not happen and uh, you would appreciate that 4% of the people in india 4% of the taxpayers contribute to about 60% of the taxes Correct. so keeping that in mind is it right to expect that that burden on that 5 4% of 5% people is marginally reduced so that they are more motivated for investments for modernization and so on and so forth uh, while the expectation on the cards look good uh, but it may not happen the reality is it may not happen so yeah. that's the answer that was an easy answer that it may not happen right. um, in the right. near future perhaps yeah. Right. So, Abhishek, to that as well, in terms of where the tax-free work from home allowance expectation is, uh, do you see anything on that front? Uh, sorry, work from home? Uh, you know, people have been talking of tax-free work from home allowances, basis what you mentioned as well in terms of, you know, the internet usage that's happening, uh, the other expenses that have increased as well in the form of electricity because people are working from home. So, anything in terms of uh, a work from home allowance or something that you see? See, today there is a standard deduction of 50,000 rupees. Hmm. And that has been going for how many years? I even don't remember now. Hmm. Now, keeping in mind the standard deduction, which is currently there presently, and the amount which individuals are today spending because of work from home, there is a very high likelihood that the standard deduction, in whatever way, it could be COVID salary deduction or standard deduction, they may call it or give it some fancy name to link it to COVID, still send the message across that there is a deduction which has now been allowed uh, due to work from home and so on and so forth, and probably that may continue for two years. So that standard deduction or that some sort of deduction is expected, that may come uh, for sure, that is on the card. So that will be a populist measure at, as, as well. But I think more importantly, what I think is expected and may happen is, of course, with respect to the savings under Section 80C. Now, that limit is for is uh, rupees 1,50,000, and that limit is there for seven years. I mm. think seven years we have gone miles ahead now. Okay. That 1,50,000 to incentivize savings must increase. I am very optimist about it that it will increase. <laughs> What may also happen is that if you see the health insurance exemption under Section 80D, that is only 25,000 rupees uh, per person. And uh, if you see life insurance or the term insurance plan, there the limit is 150, but it gets covered under Section 80C. So yeah. I think keeping in mind the health-related issues, the insurance-related issues, they may have a separate exemption for the term insurance, the life insurance, term insurance part of it. They may have it over and above 150, or they could overall increase that limit under ATC. That must happen is on the cards. Looks like for seven years it has not been increased now. So that's the right time to increase it. Perhaps give more benefits to individuals with respect to health insurance and term insurance. That is expected. That must happen as well. Right. So, you know, very interestingly, you brought the point of a uh, populist measure that the government is looking at as well. Uh, do you do you think that this budget could be a populist one? Not too much of it will be towards the populist measure, because frankly, the populist measure also means that, you know, there'll be less of tax collection. Now, if we see a lot of these infrastructure projects which are there, Mm. The government needs to complete a lot of these projects by 2024. So I think this year it may not be a populist measure. Uh, the government would want to do more spending. I don't know whether uh, uh, Nirmalaji fixes the fiscal deficit in the range of 6.5% to 6.8% or like 2021, she may perhaps be a little aggressive to spend more uh, this year and uh, perhaps a higher fiscal deficit. That is to be seen, but my expectation is that the fiscal deficit will be fixed at around 6.5% to 6.8% in that range. And if that happens, 
this budget cannot be a very populist budget, at least not this year. Correct, but that's going to put the government pretty much in a catch-22 situation as well with the ele uh, elections in five states which are coming up. So that's something that the government will have to consider. And the second factor that they need to consider on this front that we're talking about is uh, with regards to the Omicron wave as well, because no one really knows how big an impact Omicron has said uh, with regards to different businesses go yet. You know, there is an impact. A uh, few businesses have not really seen much. So it's still a catch-22 situation for the government. Don't you think so? No, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, if I were to answer that question, I would answer it very, very differently. I think there are two sectors which government must focus uh, by way of incentivizing, by way of uh, the direct benefit going to the consumers and so on and so forth. And I think one is education and second is health. And I am speaking that for a reason. Mm. Now, why health? Today, the country has seen in last almost two years the impact which has been created because of this pandemic. We do not want to get into the situation where we do not have health infrastructure. We do not want to get into the situation where the country or the pharmaceutical sector is not able to manufacture those essential drugs. So I think one on the cards certainly be to reduce customs duty impact on certain of those raw materials which are used today to indigenously manufacture these medicines in India. So for instance, if you see about denatured ethyl alcohol, from the concessional rate of 2.5%, advertently or inadvertently, that has gone up to 5%. Now, okay. that's, is, that's an essential product for me to make hand sanitizers, or for that matter, for it to be used to further make Remdesivir. Now, today it may not be relevant, mm -hmm. but if the import prices of those products will increase, the domestic manufacturing will get hurt somewhere. So I think those imports with respect to health needs to be addressed. Also, if we see the COVID related expenses which have happened. Now, if we see a lot of families have suffered in this financial year because of COVID due to hospitalization and so on and so forth. Now, could there be some way to give a deduction with respect to those expenses which have been incurred or may happen in the near future? So even if you have an insurance policy, uh, the cover is only to the extent of 8 lakh rupees, 10 lakh rupees generally when there is hospitalization but actual expenses are much more. Eight, 10 lakh rupees today, uh, you know, you don't even feel that, you know, that is enough. I so I think when this spending is there with respect to COVID related activities, will the government come out? Will, will uh, the government be compassionate enough to today give some sort of deduction when there are actual health related issues because a person would not want to have a double brunt of high taxes and then not getting any deduction with respect to health services. So I think health sector is certainly uh, the focus area. Second is very important again is education. education. And when I say that, I say that with full responsibility. Today, if you see last 20 months or 24 months, the way the education services are getting imparted, it has completely changed. The dynamics have changed. Uh, will it become real for future i don't know will it become hybrid for future i don't know but yes as we speak it has become a reality we need technology upgradation to happen in educational sector be it at what level state level uh, education institutes private run institutes or the most modern institutes now if the government focuses on health if the government focuses on modernization of education by way of technology advancement it will certainly help and if you see today how education sector is taxed so for instance if they have a revenue of thousand rupees mm. to the extent of 1500 rupees is what they could accumulate in terms of profit so if 15 percent now which means that if there is an expenditure which is not there beyond 85 percent it is difficult for them to you know, carry forward these profits. So what I want to say is that they must be incentivized today to have these upgradation in technology, which must happen. There must be an incentive enough for them, which must be given. There must be notional deduction for this technology advancement, which they do. And if they improve in technology, they must be given additional deduction, the way it is for scientific research development and so on and so forth. 
they get added advantage they are incentivized so i think those are the measures which must certainly come uh, which will help uh, the government to focus on these sectors and these education institutes because otherwise they are paying tax on the differential amount they may just carry it forward uh, that balance of 5% which in my example remains so i think it is better to incentivize them it is better to enhance technology in education sector so i think health and education must remain the focus area of the government if they have to uh, look at on a holistic basis right so so you know when you mentioned about health and uh, education as well uh, another aspect that everyone is considering is easing of the tax burden of 18% on term insurance policies do you think that's something that the government could consider and bring down the gst see i think uh, budget is not a very good time to make a lot of changes about gst mm. because mm. that happens uh, in the gst council meeting council meet, yeah today we know that uh, fiscal federalism is today at its peak with all of these decisions with respect to gst being taken by the gst council uh, it may not happen in the near future but whether that should happen or not i am a firm believer that 18% on term insurance is a high tax uh, this must reduce can reduce so i think the government at some stage may think of rate rationalization for gst as well uh, we do not know currently whether uh, the merging of 12% and 18% will happen at 16% 15% or it happens at 18% but certainly to answer your question i think that will make lot of sense to increase uh, the gst rate on these term insurance right and overall apart from these measures that we've already spoken about uh, abhishek which are the other crucial aspects one should be considering and watching out for in the budget i think i am very optimistic when it comes to electric vehicles uh, for a reason today electric vehicles are not very popular so from the perspective of reducing pollution and from the other perspective also that you need to encourage the sector electric vehicles manufacturing and usage has to be promoted now how do you do that mm. today if you talk about the affordable housing right there is a preferred rate of interest for affordable housing the loan rate interest on car is different and home loan is different right if you could get the rate of interest for electric vehicles somewhere closer to affordable housing the manufacturing will boost up we will address a lot of uh, problems uh, which the auto sector may face with respect to evs and also what may happen is that uh, once this uh, once this uh, production increases and the usage of evs increases the pollution and all other problems are also resolved to a very large extent so i think that must be on the cards i'm sure with respect to electric vehicles there will be some announcements and if that happens uh, whether that announcement comes by way of incentivizing the sector by way of product linked uh, uh, schemes pli schemes and so on and so forth uh, no one knows but i think the sector deserves some encouragement at this stage right and and taking about these sectors as well what's your view with regards to support to msmes as well as the contact intensive sectors because uh, clearly uh, you know measures to boost credit flow to these sectors and to address their stress is something which needs to be taken care of especially when you talk about hospitality or you talk about you know travel when you talk about logistics i mean there has been a long standing demand status from the hotel sector as well to be potentially be given the infrastructure status so anything on that front so i think if you see related problems with respect to msmes or people who are in the mid income group category today what is the problem yeah. the problem is that if you see deductions of ad hoc deductions of 50% for a professional the limit there is 50 lakh rupees so for example doctors chartered accountants lawyers etc they get ad hoc deduction from income to the extent of 50% under section 44 ada if they are not claiming any expenditure and if they are not claiming any depreciation now i think that limit from 50 lakhs must certainly increase because if you see the traders and the manufacturers they get that benefit to the extent of 10 crore rupees provided of course 95% of the transactions are digital and so on and so forth so i think 
if you really want to encourage the mid size people or these mid middle uh, uh, level professionals you need to increase that limit because what will happen the compliance burden on these people will reduce they will be more uh, open to pay taxes on a higher amount more formal economy will move uh, and so on and so forth so i think that limit must increase um, from 50 lakh rupees to perhaps a crore or even if it is 2 crore rupees i don't see any loss there because the higher uh, the that amount is the compliance burden gets reduced so i think that's there secondly if we talk about few of these problems with respect to msme sector today there are a lot of regulations today there are a lot of compliances we've been talking about ease of doing business in india and so on and so forth but the compliance costs have increased right so can there be a better mechanism to increase some of these threshold exemptions so for instance if you talk about gst the threshold exemption is 20 lakh rupees and i was telling someone else the other day that the 20 lakh rupees is very very low amount because that leads to some about 50 500 rupees a day so do we need to look into those threshold limits and so on and so forth both on the direct tax side and the indirect tax side the answer is yes i think we need to reduce the burden and if you actually want to if you uh, want to give the actual benefit to the msme sector the actual benefit could go to them by reducing the hardship for, which comes to them for doing business right they will manage their business they know their business is very really well they are known in the local market but they are bother too much about compliances and a lot of these things which happen all around right and and with all of this uh do you think that the government will increase their focus on increasing the share of manufacturing in gdp that's one and two the pli schemes and other schemes that actually promote make in india is something that will have its due interest this time around so i think this product linked incentive schemes we must see the objective of these schemes for different sectors uh uh-huh, uh-huh. if the objective of the scheme is to give benefit only to top players then then it's a different discussion altogether but if the objective of the scheme is to promote a sector mm. then the threshold limit of investment must reduce so for example if you want to give the incentive to the pharma sectors and you say the active manufacturing ingredient manufacturer manufacturing all of these products a to z will get the benefit then don't have a very high threshold exemption limit for either substantial investment expenditure and so on and so forth because then only the big ones will get the benefit the yeah. msme sector will never get that benefit so keep that limit a little low so there could be more participation which may happen and the sector gets the boost so i think except for certain sectors where we know for a fact that uh, for example electric vehicles or for that uh, fa- uh, matter um, any other such sector there the limits could be set high but i think for few sectors that limit must be seen again so that the benefit is given to a larger base and perhaps the quantum of benefit to each individual may reduce but the base has to expand exactly. and then only the benefit to the msme sector will flow in absolutely i think you know this time around it seems that the budget could be interesting from a lot of aspects maybe some places yes there could be disappointments because i'm sure that the government cannot really keep uh, all the 130 million people happy so in the country be disappointed i'm sure <clears throat> but i think through the medium of uh, your channel what i would suggest is that today if you see that 4% of the tax payers and i mentioned right. that you know they contribute to 60% of the revenue tax. yeah now you know how these miles in airline industry work mm. or for that matter in hotel industry work right you have blue silver gold platinum and at last there is an ambassador category if you have paid taxes beyond a level i think if you really need to incentivize the rich to pay taxes the country today needs to have a pan linked aadhar linked government issued cards mm. these premium cards must be given to those tax payers who are paying higher amount of income so for example if you are in the uh, category of 10% surcharge mm. then you get a blue card if you are in a 15% category surcharge you get a silver card 
if you are in a 25% surcharge category, you get a gold card. And if you are in a five crore plus with 37% surcharge, you get a titanium elite status. Mm -hmm. That must be used as a card for different facilities to these individuals who are contributing okay. significantly. Now, for example, if you are paying surcharge at 25% and you have paid that for 10 years in your life, right? As a professional or as a businessman or whatever, you become a lifetime gold card holder. 10, 10 years you pay that, you become a lifetime gold yeah. card holder. You pay surcharge of 37% of the highest tax bracket, you become a lifetime titanium card holder. And for instance, if you pay 100 crores of tax in your lifetime, you, became, you become uh, an ambassador class. So what will happen is the moment these incentives are linked, and this will, by the way, will not hit the government uh, on the revenue side at all, because you're just incentivizing them. And you could link certain of uh, those facilities for them. So for example, if they have to get their Aadhaar car updated, they can just walk in into a specialized uh, uh, a place so that they save their time. If there's an entry to the airport, uh, you have some uh, preferred entry for these people. So you save their time. They are paying more taxes. They right. get some sort of such benefits, which uh, is not hitting the government on the revenue side. They are incentivized to tax, uh, uh, to pay tax. So I think such measures will certainly help the government to boost revenue and that 4% of the tax pair, uh, which today may not be too willing to pay tax, may not mind to pay tax till the time they're getting some benefits out of that. Probably that 4% number could overall increase as well on the back of the benefits that the others see. Absolutely, absolutely that may increase. So <laughs> what will happen is, see today, if you see the high income group tax pairs, one, of course, is the government compulsion that you have to pay tax. You are uh, living in the country, you have to pay tax. That's a separate reason. You know, a lot of these uh, HNIs today have offices, even overseas, they invest their money from outside of India to wherever, you know, in uh, foreign stock exchanges and so on and so forth. Now, you want to retain the money in India. You want to retain that income which generates from that money also in India. Now, if you give them such incentives, right, which could be status, which could be some preference over others, they will be more motivated. Today, the HNI group is more inclined to pay tax because they're seeing overall infrastructure development. So if you see a lot of these cities, the B cities have been connected to the metros and these infrastructure road development projects are great, which is, you know, the great thing which has happened in India in last uh, six to eight years. Mm -hmm. Second thing why these guys would not mind to pay tax is because when these taxes are going to the government and are being used for right reason, they are used for that class of people which needs more support or which needs most support. If support is not given to those people, then there'll be more crime, right? So it helps HNIs in that sense as well. Now that is historic, that is academic. But if you do some out of the box thinking, and incentivize this 4% of the population to pay surcharge, mm. but get some benefit. So for instance, if I am in a 37% surcharge category, I'm paying tax to the extent of 30%, plus 37% surcharge. Mm. I need a booster dose. I need not go out from the house. I just need a, to call someone and someone will come to my home and give me a jab. What's the problem? I am contributing significantly high. So why must I step out of the house and spend my time? So simple things like that, could completely change the perspective, Absolutely. completely change the way people today feel uh, the pinch of paying taxes, that mm. tax must be paid uh, out of the will. Uh, and that's why if you see this year, a uh, lot of advanced tax collection has gone up because people do not want additional burden of interest, which comes uh, by way of non-payment of advanced tax. 54, 55% advanced tax has increased, which means it clearly reflects that people today know about the tax system they are willing to pay tax yeah. they believe in the government they know for a fact that the penny which has been paid by them is spent judiciously is spent for right reasons is spent for infrastructure uh, the government is doing right spending now if we add icing to the cake it will help absolutely you know very well uh, put forth Abhishek. I mean, a good point as well. And that's something that the government should hear this and take this I'm up as well. Give a note to Nirmala ji on this very soon. Absolutely. It's just that I'm not able to meet her for some time now because of COVID. 
absolutely you know, but good luck to you for this because this is a really good gesture that you're talking about as well which will incentivize uh, the population overall to start increasing the tax payments automatically which recycles to a good revenue stream for the government as well absolutely absolutely thank you abhishek so much for joining us on the show as always it's a pleasure it's always good to hear new things from you uh, good luck stay safe and speak to you soon after the budget you be safe thank you thank you thanks subscribe to our youtube channel for in depth interviews of india inc and press the bell icon so that you do not miss our updates